it's Sheena Shea, and as you know, life can get crazy when it's all happening. But whether you're a mom like me or have a ton of work engagements also like me, everyone should have two minutes to spare so everyone can enjoy a Factor meal, a delicious, dietitian approved meal that's fresh, never frozen, and gets delivered right to your door. You can choose from calorie smart options, protein plus options, and more. Visit factormeals.com slash Shea50 for 50% off your first order. Parenting is an epic journey of highs <laughs> and lows. Therapy can help you navigate it all and take care of yourself so you can be the best parent possible. And BetterHelp makes it easy. Complete a brief questionnaire, match with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. 100% online and designed for maximum flexibility. Get started at betterhelp.com forward slash parenthood for 10% off the first month. Hello and welcome to this. This is the Egg Chasers Rugby Podcast, the podcast about rugby that doesn't take itself or the game too seriously. I'm JB, alone in the dungeon, but kind of joined down the line-ish by Tim Cocker in a van and Phil in his living room. How are we, gentlemen? I'm very well. I'm, 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 I'm having to think. We should really have got our theme tune done by a kid's choir. In fact, can you get Lucy <laughs> and Annabelle to sing, just just to a, ca- a cappella sing the theme tune? That would that would be amazing. Well, I would, but my kids are only one quarter Asian, and that would not be diverse enough. I mean, the number one requirement for, for a choir, it would seem, is not that it can sing, but it is suitably diverse. So no, sadly, oh, hold I can't. On, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm actually gonna stick up for the idea, the concept. <laughs> these, these kids are orphans. <laughs> what? <laughs> They the were idea, orphans. The idea, no, there was wrong with the idea. It was a nice idea. They were orphans. Badly, badly executed. Yeah. No, they weren't. I feel terrible now. I think they were. <laughs> they, yeah, they weren't okay. orphans. Well, this, know, no. That's fine, but I, there you go. They were they, they, They're orphans. Hang on a minute. Let's just. If the number one requirement for singing in a stadium is not having parents, I think they've got their criteria wrong. <laughs> Where where are you, Cocker? Because your your signal is dreadful. Uh, you're dipping in and out, so you must be having fun. Where are you? Uh, yes. Do you know what? I will I will flip to the five G on my phone, which I'm I'm using up at a rate of knots. I've oh, got like you're this stealing uh, Wi Fi from somebody. Is that what you're up to? No, no. I've I've bought this like I've got this device and bought a SIM card. It's like meant to to, to create a hotspot of some a little, sort. A little hotspot. But the, but the actual bloody the the native French one is dreadful, and my English five G seems to be working much better. So I hold on a minute. Okay, well, whilst you sort out, sort out that, yeah, I'll, I'll um, sort that out. I'll say hello to Phil. Hello, Phil. Hello, JB. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. So, what we're we doing today? We're talking about the the preview of the World Cup games because, of course, all of the teams are out. Uh. Many of the sure. teams are out. Yeah, I'm not sure all of the teams are out. Some teams are out. Anything taken your fancy so far? Well, I, I, I did want to touch on a little bit of news slightly before that, which is the Tom Curry um, ban that we that we received. Because that's, that's probably the biggest bit of news that's occurred since we last recorded uh, what feels like... Um, Six hours ago. Yeah, it feels like six hours. I think it was. I think it was a mere forty-eight hours ago that we last recorded a podcast. Yeah. So um, if Tom Curry's banned for two games, right? Which allegedly he is. No, not allegedly. He is right. He. Yeah. What would be the obvious replacement to you? Um. Probably Willis. Not or, Ben. Or maybe. Not Ben Curry. No. <laughs> well, he's he's injured, isn't he? Well, that's what that's what they could do. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I might have to disconnect and then come back in if it um, persists. But uh, the obvious thing would be Steve Balthwick to announce that because of the two match ban, he is dropping uh, Tom Curry from the squad and calling up Ben Curry. Yeah, so I think I can just about tell the difference between the two of them. 
You wouldn't need to play Ben Curry. You would just need to ask him to look disappointed whilst Tom plays. <laughs> Very good. If only... I think the, the reason why Ben Curry missed the... Um, certainly the... the um, warm-up camp and everything else was because he was injured. He did his hamstring very late on in the season, didn't he? Yes, so he, did. he was injured for the World Cup. Yeah. So if if only they had played down that injury, they could have actually used that ploy. Indeed. So uh, are, you, are you happy with the ban? Do you, is it proportionate, do you think? Uh, I'm a bit surprised. <laughs> yes, but I am a little bit surprised, I must admit, that they didn't try and appeal it. So the RFU, who tried to appeal and on first pass successfully appealed Owen's Farrell, Owen Farrell's red card, which to me, the mitigation was less and the um, act more serious than Ben Curry. They appealed that, uh, but they decided against appealing this one. That was probably the most surprising thing. So once once they don't appeal it, then the red card stands and you just get meted out the kind of standard fare, which was for um, relatively low um, uh, harm incidents. And a guy who's got a pretty clean record was three weeks reduced to two if he's got, um, if he attends tackle school. Tackle school, um, what a joke. So so I'm, I'm fine with that side. I, I'm just, I said last week, um, I thought there was, there was at least grounds to argue mitigation. Look, um, whether those grounds are right or wrong, but there is at least grounds to argue mitigation because there is a significant drop in height. Uh, here's what I would argue, right? And Tim, feel free to, to jump in as soon as your Wi-Fi is fixed and whatnot. But if it was Argentina next week or a week after that, I think they would appeal. But actually, what's the point? Tom Curry is one of the few players who I think is guaranteed to start when he's fit. You're not going to need him against whoever you're playing next, and you're probably not going to need him until what Samoa, and you might not even need yeah. him then. Frankly, you know, it's just is one of those yeah. things you just might not need. So the next big game is probably going to be Wales or Australia or Fiji, depending on how things pan out. At which point they will need him, and because he's a starter, I mean, do you want to risk? Imagine if he did his crucia in playing Chile or playing Japan. Like, there's just no point, is there? And there is intrinsic cost in defending this. I don't know how much it costs to wheel out the barristers to write Owen Farrell's 800-word report or 800-page report or 80-page report or whatever the hell it was. It's not, it's not cheap, though. <laughs> you, you know, uh, Bill Sweeney has got to save all the pennies he possibly can in order to pay himself. So unless he absolutely needs to, I don't see why he just don't wear the two-week ban and go on with it, two-game ban. Well, that is that is precisely what they have done. Yeah. Um, so he he will definitely miss Japan. He'll definitely miss Chile. He will be eligible for Samoa, um, and then uh, unless something goes disastrously wrong, he will hopefully be fit, firing, and ready for the quarterfinal. So yeah, that's that's what they've chosen to do. And maybe they can use that to kind of uh, cow some favour for a future potential appeal and say, oh look, we didn't we didn't appeal that one, but we're going to on this one. So you need to. Uh, Give Take it a, seriously. Let us off. Yeah. Yeah. Do us a favor on this next one. Yeah. Um, okay. So which of the teams are not out? That's probably a better way to do it. No, the, 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 no it's probably easier to say the ones that are out. South Africa have named okay. four scrum halves in their, in their 23 man squad, which is very, which is very fun. It is. Yeah. But you know, when you watch Grant Williams play, he's obviously a utility player. Bath can play two positions. So maybe he can. Yeah, no, 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 I, yeah. I, I know, but it's just, it's nonetheless fun. It, it it's unusual um, to pick four. They while several of them can play different positions, they are primarily scrum halves. Yeah, <laughs> they've got you've got four of them in a matchday squad. I think it's quite. I think it's quite good to see actually, because in my mind, it is just doing what everyone would like to do, which is picking your best players regardless of position. And that South Africa squad is more balanced than you realise, because of course Libic starts, but I I love. Um, Wilhelmsy uh, playing at 10 well, I think he's a great player Lib- he is Libuk, Libuk, Libuk doesn't start this week no Wilhelmsy does or Wilhelmsy uh, yes so yeah, Damien Wilhelmsy Wilhelmsy so like yeah. 
they've got plenty of options in lots of different positions. Those two boys are world class tens. You don't really, really need another one. Just just take the best guy, guys you can. Grant, Grant Williams can obviously play different positions. Um, we saw who was the guy who used to play scrum off for Northampton, whose name escapes me now. Kobus Ryan. Ryanak, he's starting. Kobus Ryanak, he can go on the wing because he's absolutely electric and he's and he's played. So this is what I mean so that, that they could legitimately have all. Four. I bet I bet you just for just for giggles, uh, Jack Nienaber and Rassi will will have all four on at one point with Kobus Ryanak <laughs> on one wing, Grant Williams on the other, Faf at ten, and Jaden Hendricks are at nine. Quite possibly, quite possibly, it is the sort of thing they would do uh, if they would be more serious about it. And I don't know if they will or not. They probably don't play Faf. I think Faf is emergency, emergency. Mm, yeah, because he is he is the starting nine. Yeah. Although, do you know, looking at those other boys, I mean, you can make an argument that any of them could start. It's not like they're bad. And Faf yeah, does have the occasional. Their squad nightmare, is outrageous, isn't it? Because it doesn't even it doesn't even you look at that team. It doesn't look like a weakened team. No, it doesn't. It just looks like another team, another monstrous team. <laughs> it's it's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, they've only played one game, but including the build-up as well, I'm loving South Africa. I'm mean, loving South Africa every bit as much as I'm loving France. Mm. So South Africa, their opposition, Romania, sadly have not oh. announced their squad. But it doesn't matter who they put out, they're going to be in for an absolute no, high. They're going to get they? absolutely pasted. Also, uh, what would we say about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. nothing. <laughs> who? <laughs> yeah. Um uh, Wales name their squad. It's all changed for them. New Zealand name their squad. It's all changed for them. Bar a couple of players in each side, it's it's twelve or 30, 13 changes to the side. So this this I think what this speaks to is the fact that this weekend's fixtures are not great. No, they're not, are they? So I think the tournament organisers loaded up the first week with some interesting games. Second week, when you know, everyone's sort of engaged and uh, you know there's a bit of interest. You get the you know, second week done, and then you get back into the meaty stuff on third and fourth week. That's what I think they've done. Yeah, and I suppose England Japan should have been a, a pretty tasty matchup when, when you think back four years. But it's just that they've fallen off a cliff. And but you know, on the, on the flip side, Tonga have got the potential to to take a couple of casualties against Ireland. So I think that's the biggest. I think that's the biggest thing out of this weekend is just coming through unscathed. There is news that Malcolm Marks has got an injury severity as yet unknown. Oh no! But um, yeah, so, so they're, like it's going to be an attritional World Cup. So that's probably oh. where where the focus is. Have we have we heard about the Marchand um, injury as well? Yeah, we he haven't actually heard. Yeah, I think looked... he's at, he, he's going to be out probably for the pool stages now. And he missed the twenty nineteen World Cup, isn't he? He's got rotten luck. Oh, because he is a hell of a player. Yeah, he really is. And they've they've got <laughs> France's three options at hooker are incredible. With when uh, the two time reigning um, Heineken Cup starting hooker Pierre Bougarit is your third choice hooker, you're doing all right. He is ace as well. I love him. Yeah, so he's be... absolutely ace. And he's third cool. choice. And by the way, I thought. I mean. Um... The starting hooker on Friday, uh, names escape me now. The guy we were just speaking about, Julian Marchand. Uh, Marchand. Julian Marchand is a great player, sure he is. But actually, I thought France came to life when Malvaca c- c- came on the field, and this seems to always happen, whether it be to lose or France. Malvaca's ace, and he's and he's on the bench again, so they don't lose much, Ooh. if anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, so, yeah, France, it, Uruguay. It a... That's got to be a walk, pretty much a walkover. Unless it's, it's all horrible. it's all walkovers except for Samoa Chile. Chile have got the potential to cause uh, an upset, I guess, against Samoa. Uh, Tonga have got the, uh, the I, don't, I just don't see them getting close to Ireland, but they've got the, they've got the opportunity to. Japan could do something against England. I just don't expect it. The only one, re- the only this whole weekend's game uh, round run of games is all based on Australia Fiji being a belter. If Australia Fiji is a dull, like. I don't know, 6-3 win to Australia with terrible, terrible play. The, the whole weekend could be a write-off. Do you know could what's really going to happen, the Tim? Momentum out of the World Cup. Do you know what's going to happen this weekend? I guarantee what? this will happen. The rugby won't be great because it'll all be like 60-odd points to nil in almost every game. Almost every game, right? Somebody big is going to get a red card, and that's going to be the story. And it's going to be yes. two or three names. I'm going to get a big red card, and it's going to affect the rest of the 
tournament. And I think it just shows where rugby's going. Um, and sadly, it's going to be the people that make the laws making the headlines come Monday morning because uh, there's just not enough competitive rugby in, in this round of games. Well, I mean, there's even talk today, another story I was reading is about the Australia haven't announced where the World Cup final will be because it hasn't been decided whether the World Cup will be expanded next year. And I, I just think we were hoping, and, and Phil mentioned this on a previous podcast, we, we were really hoping this was going to be the World Cup where we get an upset and that and that gap would be bridged. Um, but I think there's two things I take from this. The World Cup is not ready to expand. No, it's not. And, and more needs to and should be done to not sever the, the gap between the so-called tier one and tier two. And I think that, that those phrases in themselves are uh, have a negative impact in some respect. Because okay, so just to correct, it, you, correct, correct you on one thing there, the only people that yeah. call it tier one and tier two are people like us. That's not an official term. So like, if you say tier one and tier two to someone in world rugby, they will correct you immediately. They'll call it something else. I think they call it emerging nations, don't they? So I don't think it's fair to say, look... Um, yeah, we shouldn't even be calling them tier one, tier two. Well, it's only us. That... Well, that name's come from somewhere where it's ubiquitous. We haven't made it up. It's, no. it's how they've. Yeah, but, but... but I think it's probably the. I think this is exactly my point. Yeah. The bigger nations, um, the bigger unions, and the bigger country, uh, the countries, the, and the fans and the media and everything that follow the bigger nations, like England, for example, England, Wales, all the home nations, mm. everyone in the rugby championship, refer to them as tier two because they see them as sort well. Of I think below... I think it's a historic moniker, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly, but but that I think that plays into the attitude towards these teams, and that's what needs to be changed if you're actually going to end up with a World Cup where it well, is because this has got the potential. Because round three's games, uh, you've got suddenly um, round three's games. Actually, you've got like Ireland, South Africa, haven't you? Yes. Or well, no, no, you've got Wales, Australia, but that could end up being not a lot riding on it. Um, and you have got Ireland, South Africa, so that'll be big. But th- there is a potential for the interest to ebb away a little bit this weekend after a great start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're 100% right on that. Um, I'm just going to pose a different question to you, though, Tim, right? Just looking at it from a different angle. Do you think it's possible that actually the gap has been closed somewhat? Because I, I think it has. But they're just unlucky. And what I mean by that is the teams that are supposed to be winning are winning. So say if, I don't know... Uh, Chile could beat Japan, you know, three out of three out of ten times. It just happens to be that we've got you know the seven out of ten times that Japan win, and so on and so forth. Whereas last year it might have been one out of yeah. ten, something like that. And it might just be the case that yeah, the standard is going up because I was really impressed with Chile. I really impressed, but they just weren't quite good enough to beat Japan. And if you know things stick to the form book and the bookies are all right on um, how they see the game. Unless these teams start becoming favourites, which is what we'd all like, I don't think you know it, it is possible that even though the gap is closing, we just don't see the upsets that, that we want to see. I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I think the other thing as well is just to your point about expanding it. It's definitely not ready to expand, and if the authorities want to give the tier two nations, emerging nations, I should say, more of a chance, it does make sense not to expand it because it gives you regular rugby to qualify for the World Cup. And that's actually quite important. Because if your only rugby is the World Cup... So, for instance, Japan have played 17 games before they played Chile on the, on the weekend. That, that is it in four years. 17 games. Which just isn't enough. So there's a good chance that because the World Cup exists and you get entry to the World Cup, that that's going to be the majority of your, your competitive international rugby against teams that you don't regularly play against. I actually think that having the World Cup in this size could promote more competitive rugby which would be beneficial outside of the world cup window yeah i mm. just uh, i guess the, the the final thing i'd add on this is that the the world league rugby championship six nations to make money in the short term is going to have downwind negative consequences oh, and yeah. it shouldn't it should not be the way that they go well you know why the world league exists don't you just the the sheer the just Cash. The cons- well it's more than that so it's oh more... no yeah it's, it's yeah wrestling world rugby yeah. wrestling control from six nations yeah six nations world rugby they're all fighting each other uh, and of course the people they should be fighting and they shouldn't be fighting actually they should be working together but they never will 
because I guess between Six Nations and World Rugby, it's like the narcissism of small differences, is of course the top 14, which is going to dominate both of them in very short order. Phil, are you, I'm, uh, sorry, Phil, are you back? I am, I am back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to my. I've got um, Tim's French 4G connection. Ah, good. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I kind of like the idea of um, uh, idea from a distance of the principle of a world league, if it was totally different and you could make it work. And by that, I mean, <laughs> I mean that those are league... two massive parameters there, Phil. Oh, well. The, the so the the idea of a world league I'm not not against but when you consider that the only way you're gonna so you you're not gonna be able to do it with much more than ten games a season because yeah. that's roughly what you have now maybe you you have five in the Six Nations you have two or three in the summer and you have three maybe four in the winter so ten to twelve games but of the ten to twelve games. Um, nine of those are going to be taken up playing the other nine of the top 10 tier one, um, counting rugby championship and six yeah. nations as, as tier one nations. Yeah. And there's no way that you can have a, any single calendar year without a um, six nations because it's just too profitable. It's the only thing it's that makes profitable. money. It It is. And it, it makes money for those nations, um, which props up a big chunk of that, the, the rugby, the grassroots and upwards rugby in those nations. And also now it makes a bit of money for CVC. Yeah. One, so third, yeah, one third of it is CVC. Thanks, Bill. Cheers, Bill. Uh, I think, I think that one's, isn't that one about 15, 12 or 15%. It doesn't matter. It goes to, anyway. It, it yeah. doesn't go to, to us. Too much of it goes to CVC. Yeah. But what that means is half of your calendar, half of your available slots every single year will be taken up by the six nations regardless like that that is happening and there's no way around that and and really there shouldn't be but then if you want to throw the other four um tier one teams in argentina south africa um new zealand and australia and then the next biggest market in japan it basically means there is zero room for any of those tier one nations to play any of the yeah. tier two nations, I see, yeah. so if you could free up and, space and at the calendar, same time they don't want, yeah, and at the same time they want to introduce it with no uh, pr- promotion relegation element involved. So you're, well, you're effectively just like shutting the yeah. door. Yeah, and this this is the thing: like you've either got to give up um, the six nation, the most profitable element, which will not happen, or you can't do promotion relegation and you have to exclude the tier two and that's the bit that like i don't want to get rid of the six nations and i would love to have more tier one uh vt tier two games yeah um, and more 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 overall um games where um tier two teams are exposed to different yeah. competitive rugby exactly as you said about the qualification so- jb you just can't square those two circles without something major changing. And another thing which we need to consider as well is I don't think international rugby. Hi, it's Sheena Shea from Vanderpump Rules here to tell you guys about Factor. It's my one-stop shop for nutritious, fully prepared meals, which means there's no grocery shopping, no meal planning, and no cooking required. They have tons of options to choose from every week. Factor is like having a personal chef, but without the wait. It only takes two minutes to heat and eat. Plus, all their meals are fresh, never frozen. Visit factormeals.com slash Shea50 for 50% off your first order. Parenting is a wild ride. One minute, they're demanding a banana. The next, they're mad because you gave them one. Therapy can help you navigate these ups and downs, and BetterHelp makes it easier to get started. Fill out a brief questionnaire, match with the licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no extra charge. It's 100% online, convenient, and flexible enough to suit any schedule. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash parenthood for 10% off your first month. Is the best way to produce better international rugby. So it's all very well saying Jordan need more games, Chile need more games. I mean, the biggest benefit to Chile is not more games. It is keeping their squad together or having a one really, really powerful club team, as we were speaking about. Um, and I think that is the model 
for the emerging nations, and not just for the emerging nations, all nations. You know, you need their club teams playing competitive rugby week in, week out, in something that means something. Um, I think Namibia. I mean, they do have a team in the Curry Cup, I think. Um, but surely they would benefit from more exposure to you know, to cl- uh, cl- club rugby on a, on, a, on a consistent basis. Or you know, just so many, there's so many good examples. Fiji have benefited enormously from this. So I actually don't think the best model for, for international rugby is more international rugby. I think it's more club rugby at a higher level. I I completely agree with that, and we spoke about it the last two weeks. I think that's yeah. it's something to take out of this and the rise of Chile, and the good things that Uruguay are doing, the good things that Fiji are doing, the good things that Argentina did and continue to do because the players have got great cohesion thanks to playing five years together in that Jaguares team. Mm. Like you need that, you need that in Georgia. You need a team in Georgia playing competitive games in Europe. Same with Romania. Same. Same with any of them. If I had serious money, like serious money, and I wanted to invest into rugby, like everyone talks about the United States being the, the place to go, I wonder if it's South America. That's what I think. The Spanish-speaking nations. You've already got a good basis. You've already got three, four, four countries at play. Def- definitely three countries at play. I mean, to me, it well, sounds you... like a really good idea. Do you remember a few years ago? I've not seen any videos for a little while. But a few years ago, there was a load of videos of Brazil playing. And the thing that was amazing was the power of their scrum. Yes, this is ringing a bell. And, how, and, and I will add how, how lovely their stash was. <laughs> yes, of course. But yeah, Brazil had a, an amazing... I, I need to look into that. But Brazil had an amazing scrum. Yeah, can you imagine the cliches that would come from a Brazilian team, though? I mean, the cliches in rugby are bad enough already, but the Samba boys, the skill, the kicking ability, none of which would be true. But that's they, exactly what they'd be talking about. So Brazil do have the Cobras who play in the Super Rugby Americas alongside uh, Penarol, which is the Euro- Uruguayan team, and Selknam, which is the very successful Chilean team. I tell you what, who I... The, who the whole pack is based on. I'm pretty sure that would be the rugby market that I'd put my, my money into. That one. That's, that one right there. That's, I mean, if you want to buy low, sell high, that this it's, it's a market that has some growth potential, some significant growth potential. Yeah. Well, just, just touching on club, club rugby for a second and just obviously France being the model. I, I wanted to go and just do a recce and make sure I knew where I was going. Okay. Tomorrow morning, Scot- Scotland have an open training session at their air base, so I'm going to go down there and mm. um, just um, see what I can get. And it's at Stade Nissoir, which is the, the top team in, in the area. It's the Nice rugby team. And they're in the third division, so it's at Federal 1. And it was awesome being there. They've got a brilliant little stadium. It's like, it just blew my mind. It was like, Oh my goodness! This is like a better atmosphere here than you get. At, it wasn't a game on; it was just like the academy was down. There was the youth teams were all out training. Um, the club was just buzzing, and uh, and that's the third division. It was ace. Yep, yep. We're in trouble, Tim. We're in trouble. We're in real, real. Well, no, trouble. Well, but no, but but I I say France is the life raft, and it's it's showing the way. Oh yeah, yeah. You know that life raft is going to pick up all of the uh, drowning players from the from the, from the Premiership and then the English leagues. We're in serious well, trouble. Well, I listened to the the podcast that um, my phone decided to do an update when I when, when I was starting, so I, I missed the other day. So I listened to that, and I'm I'm kind of more optimistic that G- the give changes me, that need to be made will be made. Give me so one, anyway, but give me one no, optimistic no, 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 change. No, no, this is World Cup. This is World Cup. This is World Cup. <laughs> this is World so, Cup. Um, Tim, here's a little fact for you for tomorrow. You might you might already know this, but one of the current Scotland squad uh, played for Stadney Soir for a couple of years. Fair play, Phil. I, didn't, I did not know that. That's a great stat. So this is I'm not, this is from. Uh, I'm going to pretend I, I, I knew it all along, though. Well, so on July on 25th of July 2017, the Scottish Rugby Union announced a performance pathway in partnership with Stade Nissoir. As part of this partnership, several Scotland 
um, rugby players join the French club, including former London Scottish player Dave Cherry. Wow. Well, well, well. Good knowledge. Great knowledge. That's great knowledge. That is fantastic knowledge. I'm gonna pre- I'm gonna pretend like I knew that all along. If I, was a, <laughs> if I was a professional rugby player, I'd want to have a stint in France. I tell you, you did have a stint in Fr- uh, in New Zealand. Um, hang on, I'll come back to that in a second before I continue. Uh, I'd want a stint in New Zealand, France, Japan, England. I think I'd put the money to one side and England um, ambitions to one side because they're not wor- it's not worth that much anymore for a start. And just go and try and get as much experience around the globe as I possibly could. Hmm. So who who are you going to say did ha- did a stint in New Zealand? Yeah, because it's quite interesting. So, um, a friend of mine, uh, Chris Bentley, played back to back seasons. So he played something like I can't remember the exact consecutive weeks or games that he played. But when uh, when New Zealand were playing their season, it was the off season of of England. So he basically played for two mm. two or three years straight. Go, go like going back, back back and forth, which I think is exactly how you do it. That's cool, isn't it? But there's... Have, a, have a shorter career, but fit more seasons in in that time. Well, well, I mean, even that. I mean, I think he played till he was like mid thirties. I think. Yeah, I know, yeah. I yeah, think Tom fair. Wood did the same. I think Tom Wood had yeah. a little stint. Famously, so did Martin Johnson. But I'd like to know who um, the, who the English guy is who has played the most top leagues. Probably Haskell. Haskell's Haskell's a good, great shout. good maybe. Did, did you? He, he did South Africa, didn't he? He did. Jamie Roberts. Jamie Roberts. That's, that's the answer. Surely. Jamie Roberts. Has Probably, been everywhere. Yeah. South Africa, Australia, Japan. Japan. No, I don't know. If he, did you Japan? He probably and did. France. Definitely France. France and England, England and Wales and Wales. Yeah, probably. Um, it's, can I, I'll just I push this conversation on to something else that was, that was quite interesting. Alan Waters uh, has, has basically said that England looking bad in the warm-up games was all part of the plan. Now, not directly saying we wanted to play badly, but his, if you uh, do you remember, I think it was the Ireland game, or it might have been one of the Wales games, I, I remember seeing England walking out of the tunnel for the second half, and I was just like, they've got 1,000-yard stairs on. They look like they have no energy. And that was one of the things we said during the World Cup warm-ups. They've got no energy. Yeah. Well, Alan Walters has basically said he's been loading up the players so that they have been tired if, uh, when when they've been playing the World Cup warm-up games. And that may explain the sudden boost of energy that it appears they have. And players like Maru Itoji, who looked a shadow of himself, suddenly looking like he's back towards where he was four years ago. Maybe Alan Walters, who is highly regarded, has won a World Cup with South Africa four years ago. Maybe he has actually got a plan. So two things I'd say about this. If anyone else in the world had said that, I would mock them mercilessly. But Aled Walters, as you say, Tim, has got one hell of a reputation. And he kind of gets the benefit of the doubt. If that's what he said, I tend to lean towards the fact it might be true. That's my first thing. But there is another thing which I would like to question on this, which is, is there not a massive correlation between fatigued players and potential injury? And is that wise? Mm -hmm. So... I I would I think the answer to that second one is um, probably um, yeah I don't know don't know the def, the data for definite but maybe they just looked and said well we've got enough depth in our in the positions therefore it's a risk we're willing to take to get that boost yeah I see what you're saying but you know aren't you wanting to load these players so that they go through a process and come the end of that process when they deload and then stop playing, which is quite, it, by the way, it's quite common in lots of other sports, isn't it? Like weightlifting, mm-hmm. for example. You load, you load, you load, and then a week before competition, you start deloading, or even two weeks uh, before. So, yeah, yeah. You know, it is a thing that happens. There's no two ways about that. Um, but then it's sort of counterproductive, isn't it, to take a guy out who's done, say, 75% of his loading because he's injured and bring in a fresh guy who's done no loading. Well, have they? Have they? There hasn't been many injuries in the England camp. No, no. But I'm just going to t- uh, to Phil's point. Like, would they? Would they say it's worth injuring these these players? Presumably, if they put them on the journey, they want them to finish the journey. Well, then, maybe he, maybe his conditioning's so good that he manages to get the amount of amount of fatigue that he wants without crossing that line into creating an injury risk. Quite possible. The things that these guys but, can do is incredible. But also, if you let's say a worst case scenario injury um, attrition rate is, I don't know, 
then you only need 40 blokes in your squad. Like you, you, you only need to load up 40 blokes. Or, and if it's, if, if it's double that, you need to load up like just 45 blokes. So it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not that hard. Imagine and when, Go on, when you, uh, when you have 23 guys playing on the Saturday, it's not that hard to have the other um, 15 or however many guys, 17, 20, doing a significant fitness drill um, on the morning of the game or even after the game. Um, so God. everyone is getting broadly the same um, loading, using that terminology. Yeah, so I, I just want to, I'd love to be part of the conversation. So, okay, 20% dropout rate, for example. So long as we yeah. stay below the dropout rate, we're good to go. So a guy comes up to you saying injured, what do you say? Just a statistic, mate. Or if you get like a handful of props injured, do you just stop the props training altogether? It's like, no, no, we can afford more back rowers getting going down, but not you boys. You need to stop now. <laughs> maybe it was, or maybe it was um, the the guys had to work hardest where there was the most depth. Yeah, like all the back rows uh, and where else have England got depth? No, nowhere else really. The back rows had to work twice as hard as anyone else. Like you see someone go down with a crucial injury, and you just go, "Well, I guess we're ahead of uh, I guess we're ahead of schedule with our injuries because we should have two by now." That's awesome. <laughs> it is collat- collateral damage. Collateral damage. Go home, Paul. Your collateral damage. <laughs> to be fair, uh, you'd take the risk. Like if if you were in that team. You'd you'd want the risk of being collateral damage for the shot of winning the World Cup. I would have thought. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, World World Cups are won on hard work, so why not? And because you because you're kind of putting your body on the line anyway, it's kind of like I don't know. It's a, a, a part of the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's an occupational hazard. Um, exactly. So, England uh, is is the, is the team out? No. no, brilliant. Well, we'll end that. Yes. Well, well, the games, the games on Sunday, so that gets announced on Friday, Friday afternoon, evening. Got it. Okay. What else do you want to review, if anything? I think that's about it, isn't it? No, it's kind of. I'm just thinking. Uh, uh, there's not really any major injury worries. I mentioned Malcolm Marks and Julian Marchand, and Tate McDermott's out for this game against uh, Fiji, but they've got Nick White. Terrible uh, replacement, awful. Jack Jack Conan won't be playing for Ireland, but he'll be fit for the box. So there, I, I think that's pretty Dan, much it. Dan Sheehan is uh, might not be playing this game, but he's back fit, which is good for Ireland. Which yes, is very, very important good. for Ireland. Excellent. Um, okay, well, if we've got no, uh, no more, no more say about the World Cup build up for what might be one of the most predictable weeks of games that the World Cup has ever seen. You can leave it there. Well, it's a good, a good one for an accumulator. I don't know what the... It's all on the on the feed. Well, actually, if you just can't, did the seven games excluding Fiji Australia as an accumulator, you probably... Like, you could put a, a decent chunk of change down and have every confidence that you'll get... You're, like, almost guaranteed to get something a bit more back. Now, you're not allowed to do yeah. this, are you, Tim? Uh, am I allowed to bet on the Rugby World Cup? I, I might be allowed to on the Rugby World Cup. You're not allowed to bet on the Premiership. That, that's why you use my account, not, right? Not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I've never betted on the Premiership. <laughs> that back. No, I'm, uh, I haven't been allowed to bet on the Premiership. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Or the, um, Euro- or the European Cup. Well, but I guess there is one more prediction to do before we go, or not really a prediction, but a review. Have you bought any bottles of spirits or liqueurs yet, as we advised you to no. do, Tim? No, I haven't. I really haven't. I've been to CrossFit twice, though. Have you? Tell me about that. Now we're excited. Yeah. What? Uh, um, I, w- I went to um, Cag uh, Cagnes, or I don't know exactly where it is, just outside Nice, sur mm-hmm. and it, it's a really awesome box. And um, I I like practice my French all day. I was like, right, okay, so I'm gonna I've practiced how to say, can I? You know, I'm here for a week. Can I? Blah blah blah. I, I, I've practiced it in my head, and then I just went. Um, Bonjour. Um, I can't remember. I've, see, I've even forgotten what the. I hate uh, this. What, I what, what the time. French I was going to say was, and she just went, 
hey, what's your name? How are you doing? Yeah, come on in. Like in the most <laughs> incredible English ever. And then everyone was. So, But it's actually really good for, it was great training, but it's really good for your French as well because you have to listen to the instructor and you, you pick a lot of stuff up. But what I've noticed is in, in CrossFit, all of the movements are the same as as in English. So today because, I was doing, it's yeah. like uh, Trent double unders, uh, and then followed by a uh, wall walk with uh, avec dix shoulder tap. They just, it's all got the same, it's all the same. They don't translate it to French. They just, you say a squ- a squat clean is squat clean in French. Uh, is it really? Yeah. I hit a 131 squat clean today, Tim. <laughs> don't want to talk Very about good. it. But it did happen. Very good. Like you, you put those little quarter kilo uh, actually, it wasn't one thirty one. It was it was a hundred and thirty point five. So it was is a point two five plates, which I whacked on whacked on on the end. Um, are the French in good shape with all their cheese? There is one guy there who yeah they are in good shape. There was one guy there who it was his birthday yesterday, so it was, it was a little thing they do at that box where everyone goes after the after the wad's done, everyone goes in a, a little circle around him. And uh, the person does, and everyone does it with him, his, whatever birthday is in burpees. And uh, I, I said, how old is he? And he said, no, 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 you have to you have to do the burpees to find out. <laughs> so, no. Love it. He, Love all that. I'll say is that he was, in, he was in incredible shape shape for a 46-year-old. Damn incredible it. Incredible shape. Yeah. So, so awesome. I've, I've done CrossFit in two different countries, right? I think two different countries, yeah. Um one was in the Canary Islands, Grand Canaria, and I swear to God, some of those guys looked like they, they looked like they had been CGI'd. Like, they were that good shape. It was, and I think it's because they're always topless and they're tanned and they're brown and yeah, everyone was stunning. I was like, God, okay, great. And the other time I did it was in Holland. Now, if you're late in my box, basically, you know, you're scum. Uh, you get shouted. I'm at, really yeah. sorry. I'm really. Can you tell Phil this, and I'll listen to the rest on the podcast. I have to go. I've got to be on Talk Sport in a couple of minutes. <laughs> go, 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 Tim. Cheers, sorry, Tim. sorry, sorry, sorry. That was that was rude. But never off you go, mate. See ya. See you later. Um, I'm sure this podcast was his idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I was late in the for the box in Holland, and they offered me a cup of tea. What for being late? For being late because I looked a bit wet because I had to cycle there. I said, oh, would you like some tea? So yeah. I hope they, I hope they spat in it. <laughs> yeah, and then they gave me some pink cakes, which was very nice. Really enjoyed that box. Uh, now, just b- final thing to go back onto rugby bef- before we finish. If we must, I've just had a look. I've just had a look at the accumulator for this weekend. Yep. Um. So it's it's not very profitable. Is it not? So for one thing, um, France. So I'm on. This is on Betfair. Other markets are available. On Betfair, they are not even taking bets backing France against Uruguay, New Zealand against Namibia, and South Africa against Romania. Oh my word! They are they are all like basically inevitable that those teams are going to win. You you can get uh, one point zero three backing England, one point zero two backing Ireland, wow, one point zero two backing Samoa. And 1.01 backing Wales. Um, now you can get 1.3 backing Australia, but if, if as Tim said, um, as Tim said, bet on everything you can bet on apart from the Australia Fiji game. Ten quid would return you eighty pence. No. So, so, so you put ten pounds on, and if those uh, four results come in. You get your stake back plus eighty eight zero pence, uh, so that is not worth it. I think that looking at this market, what about Romania and Namibia and Uruguay to win ten pound? Well, <laughs> let's have a quick look at that then. Uh, so <laughs> Uruguay, Namibia, and Romania. Wow, that is long. Uh, let's just... That's what she said. <laughs> let's just put this in. Uh, so your ten, the same ten quid, would get you one million three hundred twenty-six thousand five hundred five hundred ten pounds. Is that better or worse odds than the lottery? 
Um, well, the lottery, I think, is about 14 or 15 million to, to one. So this is uh, 1.3 million to 10. So this is worse. This is a factor of 100 worse than the lottery. How or more. You... Uh, so, yeah, it's a factor of 100 more likely than the lottery. So if I've got £10, I should put it all on the lottery. <laughs> Um, it's it's the same. You're you're throwing away in either situation. I think you're basically burning that tenner. <sighs> wow, wow! What a week! What a weekend in store for us, eh? So if if you were going to bet on anything, I would say do a single on either Chile at twenty three to one or twenty three yeah, twenty threes or Tonga at twenty sixes, but. Both of those, I think, are probably too short for reality, but they are the most likely upsets to happen. Samoa must be playing this weekend. Yes, um, so Chile against Samoa. Oh, right, so they're, they're favourites, are they? So Yeah, right. Samoa are 1.02 favourites. Very, very strong favourites. Right, right, okay. Oh, dear. Right, well, hopefully things will get better next week. Yes. They can't get any worse. No. So when will we be back? Uh, Saturday? Sunday? Monday? Uh, p- perhaps all three. Perhaps. Well, yeah, perhaps uh, uh, all three. So from this very disjointed podcast, uh, that's our very disjointed um, schedule for next week. And um, I guess that's it. We will uh, see you sometime in the future, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. Let the boys play. Let the boys play. 